a sleepy southern town becomes a place of unimaginable horror as young girls begin disappearing. A cunning serial killer is on the loose, tormenting a family while evading capture. Until investigators could find a way to stop him, he would continue his hunt for more victims. He was a predator, abducting girls and young women from their own front yards in broad daylight. He was a sadist, phoning one victim's family, taunting them, boosting, then dashing their hope. And he wouldn't stop until we stopped him. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. This serial killer, whoever he was, could pass unnoticed in society. Yet he craved the attention his crimes provided. Somewhere in this contradiction, lay the key to his exposure. May 31st, 1985. The afternoon sun over South Carolina roasted the town of Lexington to a blistering 100 degrees. Sherry Faye Smith had found relief from the heat at a pool party with her boyfriend and fellow high school seniors. She was looking forward to the carefree days between her final exams and graduation. All of summer and the rest of her life awaited the ambitious 17-year-old. She lived with her family in a quiet, rural community, a safe place tucked away on the edge of town. The Smith's home sat on a generous lot of dense woods the house was about 200 yards from the road. Sherry's dad, Robert Smith, served as a local pastor. This Friday afternoon, he worked at home in his second floor office. He looked up from his studies to see his daughter pulling into the driveway and stopping to get the mail. In the next few moments, life in Lexington, South Carolina, changed forever. Expecting Sherry to walk in the house, Mr. Smith looked out the window again. He noticed her car remained near the mailbox, but she was nowhere in sight. Immediately, he felt something was odd. He decided to take a look. Sherry suffered from diabetes. With her blood sugar out of balance, she might become disoriented or incapacitated. When he arrived at the bottom of the driveway, Mr. Smith found Sherry's car still running and the door swung open. Sherry? Sherry? But his daughter was gone. There was no response Sherry? to his call. His mind began to race as he imagined the possibilities. Could she be lying in the woods somewhere, unconscious or in shock? Sherry! He yelled louder as he grew more frantic with worry. Sherry! There was no sign of her anywhere. Sherry was gone. Mr. Smith immediately called for help. The assistant sheriff of Lexington County responded to the call. The distraught father explained that Sherry was not the type to just run off. She was responsible, warm, and well-adjusted. Not the sort of teenager to run away.
But the sheriff took nothing for granted. He questioned Smith about his relationship with his daughter. Today, more than a decade later, Assistant Sheriff Lewis McCarty vividly recalls his impressions of the Smith family during his first conversation with Sherry's father. We discussed his daughter's grades, what kind of child she was. Um, uh, it was determined that there was no animosity between mother and father and daughter. The Smith family was a very, very close-knit family, a very religious family. Um, you just had the sixth sense that, that uh, they were extremely close, uh, that this child would not have, have run away on her own. The investigator couldn't shake the feeling that something bad had happened to Sherry Smith. And the same intuition told him it had nothing to do with her medical condition. Every minute that passed increased the likelihood that Sherry might never be found. Knowing this, the sheriff called for assistance, bypassing the 24-hour waiting period required before officially classifying an individual as a missing person. While waiting for the other officers to arrive, the sheriff and Robert Smith retraced Sherry's steps, careful not to destroy any possible evidence. But the naked eye search yielded nothing. They had to wait for more equipment and expertise. Within minutes, officers from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, known as SLED, arrived at the Smith home. Investigators combed the scene, looking for tire tracks, foot impressions, or fingerprints. They found nothing. Knowing the next few hours were critical, the authorities assembled a task force and organized a massive ground search. The possibility of an abduction prompted a swift response. Crimes like this simply did not happen. Surrounding counties sent every available officer to help. Word of Sherry's disappearance spread quickly through the close-knit community of Lexington. Hundreds of local residents offered to participate in the search. Still, they found no trace of the young woman. Though there was no direct evidence that a federal crime had been committed, state investigators called on the expertise of the FBI. They wanted the Bureau to unofficially advise in the search and to assist in the investigation. Special Agent John Vollmer from the FBI's Columbia office was dispatched to the Smith's house the next morning. The disappearance had even baffled the experts. She was nowhere to be found. And she was not from a type of family background where that would readily indicate she'd run off with somebody. She was from a very uh, stable, uh, good family background, and they immediately thought, obviously, something had happened to her. But we had no idea, at that point, what. The search urgently continued, with hundreds of volunteers and officers working around the clock. It was a daunting task. The heat and terrain hindered the hunt. When you're talking about looking in a county of, of 500 square miles, um, it, it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's extremely difficult because you don't know where to begin um, and where to go. Two long, hot days of searching passed, and still there was no sign of Sherry. It grew more and more likely that this was an abduction. Horrified that a crime like this could happen in their town, the residents of Lexington were gripped by fear. Children were not seen without their parents. No one went anywhere alone. With every hour that passed, investigators hoped there was still enough time to find Sherry unharmed.
On June 3rd, three days after Sherry Fay's disappearance, at about 2.30 in the morning, a call disturbed the Smith's restless sleep. Robert answered the phone. A voice he did not recognize asked for his wife, Hilda. Hello? The caller claimed to be Sherry's abductor. Yes. The captor apologized for taking Sherry and insisted that she would eventually be returned. He made clear this was not a ransom call. He told Hilda that she would receive a letter in the mail later that day. Just tell us what you want. He promised he'd call back and hung up. Though a phone tap had been set up earlier, the call was too short to get a trace. Sled officers who were at the Smith home called Agent Vollmer immediately. It really was unclear uh, whether she was alive or, or dead. The caller was indicating that she was alive, that he uh, would see that she was returned safely. And I think at that point, everyone was hopeful that he was truthful and that in fact she was not dead and would be returned uh, to her home and family. A letter hopefully containing clues to Sherry's whereabouts would be a welcome break but first they had to find out if the letter promised by the caller really did exist. Not wasting any time they woke the town's postmaster and ordered him to open the post office before daybreak. Then they went to work, sifting letter by letter through the piles of outgoing mail. Long envelope, something similar to this. After a half hour, the postmaster found an envelope addressed to the Smiths. Carefully, they slipped it into an evidence bag and sent it to the sled forensic labs for analysis. Inside the envelope, examiners found a two-page letter written on yellow legal paper. Their excitement melted into horror as they began reading the letter. It was entitled, Last Will and Testament. It began, I love you, Mommy, Daddy, Robert, Dawn, and Richard, and everyone else, and all other friends and relatives. My thoughts will always be with and in you, casket closed. I am sorry if I ever disappointed you in any way. I only wanted to make you proud of me because I have always been proud of my family. The letter ended with, all my love always, Sharon, Sherry Fay Smith. With the help of the Smith family, investigators confirmed that the handwriting was Sherry's. Lab examiners began the painstaking task of analyzing the letter. Searching for prints, hairs, fibers, and other clues would take weeks. While investigators hoped the document might provide other valuable leads, they were alarmed by the letter's content. We were shocked. We were concerned for her well-being. Um, there were several phrases in the letter that um, um, she refers to one would be casket closed is you know why would why would a child make a statement casket closed sherry's fate was unclear the abductor had all the answers he had promised to call again until he did the smith family clung desperately to hope just days after sherry Fay's disappearance her abductor had called to taunt the family. Since then, agents and detectives set up a voice recorder in addition to the tap already on the Smith phone. Having the abductor's voice on tape would be invaluable. If the suspect called again, they would be ready. The wait was excruciating. At 8 o'clock on the evening of June 3rd, the phone rang. Go ahead, answer it. Try to stay on the phone as long as possible. Hello? It was the voice from the night before. 
He spoke to Hilda. Did you receive the letter today? Ah, uh, yes, I did. Okay, so you know now that this is not a hoax call. Yes, I know that. Okay, listen, listen real carefully. I got to hurry. Uh, I know these calls are being traced. Uh, is Sherry with you? Sherry is now part of me. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our souls are one now. Your souls and are one now with Sherry? Yes, and we're trying to work this out. So please do what we ask. The trace had been successful. Go ahead, US-1. The suspect had called from a phone booth about 20 miles away from the Smith home. A network of sheriff's deputies staking out the area raced to the scene, hoping to catch the car still on the phone. But when they arrived, all they found was a phone dangling off the hook. Area, any cars? Give me plates, any cars leaving the immediate area right now. He had slipped away, leaving nothing behind, not even fingerprints. They just missed him. Sherry's older sister, Dawn, recollects the agonizing uncertainty. I didn't really understand what was going on at the time. I didn't understand that he was a very sick person. I'd never dealt with anybody like that in my life. Um, but I really believed that he was taking care of her and that there had to be some reason for the madness of Sherry being taken. On the surface, the abductor's phone conversations revealed nothing about Sherry's whereabouts. However, for the FBI, the phone calls offered the first glimpse inside the mind of this twisted predator. It would be up to FBI profilers in the investigative support unit at Quantico, Virginia to penetrate this criminal's mind. John Douglas pioneered behavioral profiling for the FBI. He and others developed the investigative tool from over 25 years of interviews with convicted killers, arsonists, rapists, and bombers. When someone asks for a profile, what they're looking for are characteristics, which includes uh, a gender, uh, includes age, race, sometimes uh, body typing, uh, educational level, occupational uh, type. To determine these characteristics, the profiler attempts to think like the killer. He tries to uncover his motivations. Examining every aspect of a crime reveals patterns of behavior. What emerges is a profile describing the type of person the killer will most likely be. After scrutinizing every detail of Sherry's abduction, Douglas generated a 22-point profile of the suspect. He painted the abductor as a white male in his late 20s to early 30s with above-average intelligence. He would most likely work as a blue-collar day laborer. Because it sounded as if the killer had electronically distorted his voice, he probably worked in electrical contracting. He would have a prior criminal record Douglas also suggested he lived locally. The tone and content of his phone calls indicated he was an asocial obsessive compulsive. If the stress of everyday life became too great, he would break down. He would then feel compelled to compensate for his own inadequacies through violent actions. He's a type of guy that, that feels like one grain of sand on a beach where there are billions and billions of grains of sand. He feels like nothing. He feels like a, a nobody. And how can this nobody, this personality, this person who's probably overweight, low self-esteem, doesn't, unattractive, how can he become a somebody? He'll go after victims that there was no chance that he would ever come in contact with someone like, uh, like a Sherry Face Smith. And so for the first time in their life, they can be be powerful. On Wednesday, June 5th, the Smiths received another call. This time, he gave the family directions to where they would find Sherry. Listen carefully. Take Highway 378 West to Traffic Circle. Turn left at White Frame Building. Six feet beyond, we're waiting. God chose us.
Investigators raced to the location, hoping they might still find her alive. Six days after her mysterious disappearance, investigators found the body of Sherry Faye Smith. When the Smith family received the call to the location of the body, uh, we went immediately there and, and uh, our worst fears uh, came true. Sherry's body had been laid in the woods of Saluda County, some 17 miles from the home from which she vanished. Her abductor was now wanted for first-degree murder. A week of 100-degree heat had taken its toll. The body's advanced state of decay worked in the killer's favor. The medical examiner could not determine the exact cause and time of death. To John Douglas, the location and condition of the crime scene provided further insight into the suspect's mind. He had some criminal sophistication because I believe what he did is he waited, he waited for her to now go into advanced stages of decomposition, which would make it more difficult for law enforcement to, to determine cause and method of death uh, in this state of, of decomposition. The confirmation of Sherry's murder devastated the Lexington community. That Saturday, a crowd of a thousand mourners attended a funeral service at the town's First Baptist Church. That evening, following Sherry's funeral, Hello. the killer could not resist inflicting more torment. Well, I'm going to speak to uh, Mrs. Smith. Sherry's Aunt I'm Beverly sorry, answered the available. phone. I want to speak to Dawn. I'm sorry, she's not available either. Beverly stalled him, hoping to gain valuable time for the phone trace. Yeah, I'll have to go then if I can't talk to her. But the suspect threatened to hang up if he couldn't immediately speak to Dawn. Hello? I, I, this thing got out of hand, and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I've been watching her for a couple of weeks. To who? To, I'm sorry, to Sherry. Dawn, I hope you and your family forgive me for this. When you killed Sherry, was she at peace? She wasn't afraid or anything? She was not. She was at peace. She knew that God was with her and she was going to become an angel. Overwhelmed with grief, Sherry's mother insisted on talking to her daughter's this? murderer. Did you tell her you were going to kill her? Yes, I did, and I gave her the choice, and she picked suffocation. My God, how could you? It did not escape the attention of the FBI and local investigators that the killer had mistakenly used Dawn's name when he spoke of Sherry. They braced themselves for the possibility that this killer might be turning his murderous obsession towards Dawn. But the suspect would make only one more call before falling ominously silent. Though he wasn't talking, they knew he was still out there, terrifying a community. And the profile predicted that if he killed once, he would kill again. In June 1985, FBI investigators continued to hunt the kidnapper and killer of 17-year-old Sherry Smith. While investigators focused on the Smith murder, the elusive predator pursued other plans. On Friday, June 14th, two weeks after Sherry's abduction, a man grabbed Deborah May Helmet from her front yard in Richland County as she played with her brother. She was just nine years old. The child screaming alerted a neighbor. but the woman was not fast enough. The abductor managed to slip hey. away in broad daylight. Hey. Helmick's neighbor could only provide vague information. However, the general description of the suspect and his method 
appeared eerily similar to the man the FBI wanted for the murder of Sheriff. Richland County Sheriffs immediately contacted the task force in nearby Lexington. Within moments of that abduction, we were aware of it and began to focus on that case also. We were pretty much in our minds. Um, I think that um, everybody knew these two cases were connected. For John Douglas, the case took on an even greater sense of urgency. Deborah May Helmick's fate seemed almost certain. Once they get the urge, they're out looking for the preferential victim, but if they cannot find the victim of choice, they will go after whoever is, uh, is available. And I, that was the case here with Deborah May Helmick. News of the second abduction brought Douglas down from Quantico, Virginia to South Carolina. The FBI hoped they could find nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick before her young life was cut short. In the Smith case, the killer's phone calls had been a critical link for the investigators. It had been nearly a week since Deborah's disappearance, and they hadn't heard from him. To get him to call, Douglas devised a plan. With the help of the local media, he would set a trap. And the way that One we key do that element of the plan placed Don Smith in jeopardy. Douglas had to ask the Smiths to put their other daughter at risk to catch Sherry's killer and hopefully find young Deborah. Dawn agreed. A lot of times people thought we were twins. We looked a lot alike and so they came up with this plan that if I were to answer the phone, maybe he would turn that fascination from Sherry to me. And if I could keep him on the phone talking long enough about Sherry, about himself, about anything to keep him on the phone, then they could trace the call and catch him. Douglas's strategy centered around a memorial service for Sherry. Investigators promoted the service in the local press. The agents hoped the attention to his first victim would rekindle the killer's fascination with Dawn. Douglas needed something else to bait the trap, a personal item from Sherry's room. Based on experience, Douglas knew that sexual predators are often attracted to personal items of their victims. She likes they want mementos that they can keep, even display as trophies. He noticed the koala bear. It was the mascot of the university she planned to attend in the fall. The day of the memorial service, plain-clothed agents swarmed the grounds, hoping their suspect would visit the cemetery. As the family's minister delivered a eulogy, Dawn and her parents huddled close. Though Dawn had willingly volunteered to lure the killer to the trap, the danger it presented weighed on everyone's mind. There was no telling what the suspect might do. The security around Dawn was, was heightened. We were extremely, extremely concerned about Dawn becoming a victim. Then, as planned, Dawn placed some flowers and the koala bear on her sister's grave. Now all that was left to do was wait. Using Douglas's profile, FBI agents coached Dawn on how to handle the suspect when he called. I was told to never be threatening, to never be harsh, to be real understanding and sympathetic and compassionate, and I was with him. And I think he liked that because he felt like he was very much in charge, which is something that he thrived on. Several calls came to the Smith home following the memorial service. Not knowing if it was Sherry's killer, Dawn had to answer every one. Shortly after midnight, the phone at the Smith house rang again. Hello? I would like to talk to Dawn Smith from Sherry. Will you take the call? Yes. Go ahead, please. As Douglas had hoped, 
the culprit took the bait. And as anticipated, the killer had turned his focus to Dawn. You can't be protected all the time. He made it clear to her that she was going to be his next victim. You know, uh, God wants you to join Cherry Bay. It's just a matter of time. This month, this Despite the threat, Dawn kept him on the line, enduring abuse from the man who murdered her sister, while officials traced the origin of the call. Uh, Richland County? Yeah, okay, listen carefully. Go one door. Then, before hanging up, the killer offered directions. Turn right. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Special Agent John Vollmer feared that the killer would not stop there. Once the, he called about Deborah Helmick, then you're leading into the possibility that you now are dealing with a possible serial killer who has killed now at least two, you suspect, maybe others before, uh, and may continue to kill others. Despite Douglas's success at getting the suspect to call, no one had anticipated just how far away the killer would go to avoid detection. Tracing the call from outside the area took additional time. Again, the suspect left the phone booth moments before the authorities could reach him. We were very, very close to catching him on a number of occasions. And it's almost as if he sensed this and began to move further in making his phone call. Other investigators followed the caller's directions. There, they found nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick murdered. The gamble had failed. With every missed opportunity, the probability of more victims increased. And now, Dawn was the most likely target. Investigators feared the killer would make an attempt to abduct her. An elusive serial killer had already killed two girls around Lexington, South Carolina. The slim amount of evidence frustrated FBI investigators as well as local law enforcement. But the forensic analysis was about to generate the biggest break in the investigation. The last will and testament of Sherry Smith was examined by Gail Heath, director of the question document section of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Labs. Using an ESDA machine, Heath hoped to find hard evidence. The ESDA, an acronym for electrostatic detection apparatus, can pick up images that are invisible to the naked eye. It works on the opposite principle of a printing press. Instead of coating raised letters with ink to create an image, the ESDA fills in the indentations on the document in question with graphite. When an imaging film similar to saran wrap is pulled tight over the document, a readable image comes through. After hours of examining the document, Heath found indented writing. It appeared to be a phone number and a name. The particular name and phone number in question, we were able to bring up the entire area code, the first three numbers of the prefix, um, the next two numbers, the third number we were unsure of, and then we had the fourth number. The name on the pad was Joe. From the area code, investigators determined the number was from Alabama. To fill in the missing digit, investigators called every combination of the phone number until they reached a party who had the same name as the one found on the legal pad. They finally made a match. The number belonged to a man named Joe Shepard. Investigators scrutinized his phone records. They found that he had received a call from an address just outside of Lexington in Lake Murray, South Carolina. Either of these addresses could belong to the killer. Armed with the FBI profile, local police visited the Alabama address. How you doing, you Mr. Shepard? They met Joe Shepard. He didn't match the killer's profile. Even though he was not a suspect, he could still be an important link to the killer. 
Of Police had to find out the connection between him and the Lake Murray, South Carolina phone call. Shepard explained it came from his parents' home. South Carolina officers verified that the address belonged to Joe Shepard's parents, Ellis and Sharon Shepard. Investigators went to the Lake Murray address to question the residents. The house was just two miles from where police found the body of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmer. They learned that Ellis worked as an electrician in home construction. It was a profession the FBI profile predicted. As the officers knocked on the door, a car pulled into the driveway. When investigators saw the Shepherds, they immediately felt they had hit another dead end. Besides Ellis Shepherd's profession, nothing else seemed to fit the profile. They questioned them anyway. The Shepherds told them that they had recently returned from a six-week trip. The officers casually asked if the couple knew about the Smith and Helmick murders. With every question, the police noticed Mrs. Shepherd becoming more concerned. The shepherds were beginning to suspect their house sitter, Larry Jean Bell. As they described Bell, elements of the profile fell into place. He was a white male, in his 30s, who lived with his parents. He sometimes assisted Ellis in home construction. Just days earlier, when the shepherds returned from the vacation, Bell had picked them up from the airport. He talked to the shepherds at length about the cases. He was closely following the news of the murders. It was more evidence of a meticulous mind and behavior consistent with the profile. They said that he had, had saved the newspaper articles, um, told them all about the case in, in great detail from the airport back to their residence. Again, it was uncanny how much this, this profile was on track. The detectives asked if they could see the inside of the house. Suspecting the killer had used a weapon to force Sherry Smith into the car, they asked Ellis Shepard if he owned a gun. Shepard led them to a drawer where he kept his revolver. To his surprise, the gun was gone. The officers asked the couple to accompany them to the precinct. They wanted the shepherds to listen to recordings of the killer's calls to the Smith family. The investigators needed to know if the voice on the recordings belonged to their house sitter. For a couple of months, and then they'd find out I'm sane, and then I'd get tried and get sent to lecture or put in prison the rest of my life. I'm not going to stay in prison the rest of my life. Though the caller may have electronically long. altered his voice, to the shepherds, it was clear that the man on the tape was their house sitter, Larry Jean Bell. We were all extremely elated. We could not show any emotion, but um, we, um, we knew that we had the case at that point. We had our man. The shepherds told the police that they expected Bell to return to their home at 7.30 the next morning for work. Investigators staked out Bell's residence. This time, there was no way he could elude capture. Larry Jean Bell headed down the highway to the Shepherds. He failed to notice the unmarked police car following behind him. The officers radioed to another car, waiting to cut him off at the approaching intersection. Yeah. 
June 26, 1985, at 7.19 a.m., investigators finally trapped the elusive Larry Jean Bell. This time, it was the investigators who were one step ahead. Bell was arrested without resistance and taken to the precinct for questioning. With Bell now in custody, investigators still needed to build an airtight case to make sure he would never be free to kill again. Combining hard forensic evidence with the FBI profile, South Carolina police arrested Larry Jean Bell on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. But now they had to prove beyond any doubt that he was indeed the killer of Sherry Smith and Deborah May Helmer. It was up to Lexington County solicitor Donald Myers to make the case. A career prosecutor, Myers was determined to convict the killer who had so horrifically taunted his victim's family. I did not like Larry Jean Bell even before I knew him. And I knew that this was probably a, the most publicized case that we would ever had, the most publicized in South Carolina up to that time. And I pretty much committed myself to go after him with everything I had. Though there was powerful evidence against Bell, it was only circumstantial. Still, in the state of South Carolina, a confession could guarantee the maximum sentence. Myers needed to make sure that Bell would never be able to take another life. He wanted a confession. Again, they called on the FBI to help. They recommended setting up an interrogation room that would elicit a self-incriminating statement. For instance, a map showing where the phone calls were made, uh, some pictures of the victim so that he's aware as he looks about the room to remind him of the victim. Uh, you might have uh, fingerprint cards on the table. You might have notebooks or file cabinets that would have his name on them, all to make him think you obviously have uh, narrowed in on him, you've got the goods on him, he might as well go ahead and, and uh, give it up. While the officers prepared to question Bell, other detectives secured a search warrant for the Shepherd's house. For the next 12 hours, the forensic team combed every square inch of the home looking for anything that would firmly connect Bell to the crimes. As the profile predicted, the house was in perfect order. It was meticulously cleaned, vacuumed and dusted, particularly in the room where Larry Jean Bell had been staying. But beneath the orderly exterior, the team uncovered evidence of his deviance. The bed's pristine sheets concealed a thin, dirty mattress. And beneath that lay a porn magazine and a handgun that matched the description of Mr. Shepard's missing 38. Despite the freshly vacuumed carpets, an investigator retrieved a blonde hair in the space where a vacuum cleaner wouldn't reach. A lab would match the strand to Sherry Smith. Well, how are you this afternoon? While the investigators continued the search for evidence at the Shepherd's home, detectives at the interrogation carried out the FBI's strategy. First, they made sure Bell was comfortable. As advised by Douglas, they spoke to the suspect in a non-threatening way. They pretended to empathize with him to understand his pain in order to pry him open. They walked their suspect through the growing mound of evidence condemning him. At every chance, they reminded him of the victims. Bell denied everything. However, he did make a curious request. He wanted to meet Dawn and Hilda Smith, hoping the mother and sister of his first victim might stir a confession. 
the Smiths agreed. Hilda and Don tried to mentally prepare themselves. Finally, they stepped into the room and came face to face with Sherry's killer. He began to mumble and he began to speak about how he was sorry that the person sitting in that chair couldn't have been the one that had done this. Um, but another Larry Bell could have been the one. Just, he really didn't make a lot of sense. And so I remember sitting there, I remember looking at him, I remember listening to him, and I really just felt disgust that I knew this was the man. And he wasn't even man enough to say, I did it, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make excuses. But, but my mom said the most incredible thing to him. She said, I know you're the man that killed my daughter. And um, I can honestly say that I don't hate you. And he, he got teary. But Bell's emotional break went only to the point of tears. He never made the confession authorities wanted. After weeks of compiling evidence, Myers and the investigators began to piece together the sequence of events of May 31st, 1985. Bell noticed Sherry Smith after dropping his mother off at a doctor's appointment. Something about the young woman triggered his lecherous cravings. As she left the parking lot, Bell followed. His desire shattered what little restraint he possessed. He never let her out of his sight. Sherry did not notice the car following her down the road. She pulled into the driveway and stopped at the mailbox. Bell wasted no time. Tell me the way to he had taken to Sherry go. completely by surprise. Come on, you're going with me. He brought Sherry to the shepherd's house on Lake Murray. Bell then canceled dinner with friends. He told them he wanted to stay at the shepherd's and watch a baseball game. He had already tied Sherry to the bed. The evidence showed that Sherry had been raped. Before killing her, Bell coerced Sherry to write her last will and testament. Twelve hours after she disappeared, he covered her mouth with duct tape and suffocated her. Investigators believed that she was dead by 4.58 a.m., the time Bell claimed that their souls became one. It took less than one hour for 12 South Carolinians to find Bell guilty of first-degree murder. Myers prosecuted Bell in a separate trial for the murder of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. He was found guilty a second time. With Bell's conviction, the Smith family could begin to rebuild their lives. There was a sense of, of relief that Okay, now he can't do this to me, he can't do this to anybody else, and, and he will be put away. Larry Jean Bell paid the ultimate price for his sadistic crimes. On October 4th, 1996, he was put to death in South Carolina's electric chair. Though the loss of Sherry Smith and Deborah May Helmick will always be felt, life in Lexington has slowly returned to normal. With skill and determination, the South Carolina law enforcement community and the FBI brought closure to a grieving town by ending the deadly game of cat and mouse.